The information shared on this podcast is based on our comprehensive research and understanding. All suspects are presumed innocent until proven guilty. Listener discretion is advised. Hey y'all, welcome back to the Natural State of Murder Crime Cast. I'm Jess. I'm here with Jeremy and Patty. Um, do not forget to go and like and subscribe on YouTube. And also you can catch our podcasts anywhere you get your podcasts. Spotify, iTunes, anywhere. Um, also do not forget to go and visit our website, RememberEveryVictim.com. Um, today we are covering a case um, of Clayton Reed out of Magnet Cove, Arkansas. Um, Clayton's mother, his biological mother, had contacted Revamp back in January. Um, Clayton had gone missing um, on January the 18th, and they had reached out to Revamp for help. And uh, today is March 17th, is the day that this is being recorded and Clayton is still missing. Jess, who have you spoke to in regards to this case since we began this case? Um, I have spoken with his mother. And What's her name? I've spoken with... Robin Tolleson. Mm-hmm. All right. And and Robin was the one that originally reached out to us on Facebook yes. Messenger, right? Okay. Yes. And and Robin more or less said she just needed help. And yes. So from that point, we went out with a huge team, kind of did a search, interviewed a few witnesses. Tell us more about that. Um, so we went out, it was in February, um, we had, uh, the Washita K-19, um, there were other search teams, um, that came in. Washita is the K-9 search team. We had dog. we had the Quapaw, uh, K-9 search team. Uh, there were other search teams that came out as well. Grant County, um, not Grant County, it was Garland County. And uh, Van Buren, uh, we also had the Mennonite search team that came out, and they brought a boat and sonar as well. And we also had a local gentleman that um, came out with his boat and sonar also. Um, mm-hmm. And he actually searched he searched the lake for us, and then there's also a little creek that runs off of um, Lake Catherine that actually goes back behind Clayton, Clayton's home. Um, he lived in a, mm-hmm. a camper in an RV park and um, he searched that creek for us and all that as well. Okay. And now the first day that the search began was, it was actually James Jackson and he came out with uh, his sonar. He went up and down Tiger Creek and he's got the state-of-the-art sonar, and he, he pretty much told us that he didn't feel like there was anything there that was uh, out of place with Tiger Creek, and then he did some of Lake Catherine as well. Now, the second day was the day that you got there with the Quapaw team, and they had a whole bunch of help show up with them, and we're really appreciative for that. I mean, they had Sebastian County Sheriff or Sebastian County Search and Rescue. Uh, they had Pulaski County Emergency Management. They had, like I said, uh, Garland County. Um, there was multiple teams out there helping out, and y'all actually located three eyewitnesses from the railroad. Now, I wasn't there for that. Can you tell me? We're not going to name them in this particular cast, but can you na- can you tell me what it was that they said they saw the morning of, and what the dates were at the time? Yes. Yeah. So. 
what and they I reported see. that they saw it was it would have been on january the 19th now remember we had originally heard that clayton had gone missing on january the 18th and right. so on january the 19th it was approximately 7 seven thirty in the morning and clayton was seen by three railroad workers he was walking um down, down the, railroad the railroad tracks in the opposite direction of his home towards a larger town called malvern and um what they saw he was wearing a long white sleeve t-shirt that he had pulled up over his head the back of it was pulled up over his head kind of covering his ears and what they described as looked like a uh, jeans like that color like denim color but they were capri pants and he was barefoot and said that his feet they were torn up pretty good he was bleeding and they asked him to move off the tracks and he said no and they asked him to move again and at some point he climbs up the front of the train car and is on top of the train car and speaking to them from the top of the train car and tells them to reverse that he wants to go to Malvern and they said we can't do that because you know we're working um now he eventually got down off of the train and stood to the side of the tracks and they kept going um they had also contacted another set of railroad workers that were in a truck they weren't on the tracks but they were nearby and those workers had um gone up to their shop and got got this man a pair of boots got him a change of clothes and they drove down to the next crossing station to meet him there at that crossing station and he never showed up they never saw him again but they know that he was still on the tracks because if, as they were driving from point a down the highway to the next crossing station they could still see him walking down the tracks. He just never made it to that crossing. Originally, Robin Tolleson contacted us, and I believe I was the first one to speak with her, and, and Robin told us that she wasn't there. She doesn't live anywhere near Hot Spring County. She lives a few hours away. But she was under the impression that Clayton went missing on January 18th, the evening of, and on that evening, he left without shoes. And the reason they believe he left without shoes, they lived in a, a camper at an RV park. And all the shoes that were believed to have been owned by him were still at the camper. His wallet was still mm -hmm. at the camper. His, uh, all his, most of his clothes, all of his clothes were there. Uh, he didn't have a jacket or anything like that. And of course, it was snowing and there was snow on the ground it was a really cold night so originally where our thoughts are well he's frozen to death somewhere out there and so that's why this railroad mm -hmm. track when we got the information about the railroad workers it was so <laughs> just detrimental because we found out well they saw him that morning now when we're talking about the difference in magnet cove and malvern and we'll maybe display here a map of of Highway 70 from Magna Cove to Malvern and, and the railroad tracks. We're talking about a few miles walk. We're also talking about a very heavily traveled highway. Anytime, I don't care what time it is, there's always cars up mm -hmm. and down that, that highway. Um, that said, if you've got a situation where a guy goes taking off walking from his RV early morning or even at night he's going to be seen if he's anywhere near the highway mm -hmm. now the railroad tracks aren't yes. necessarily right up against the highway but they run parallel to the highway for a while so they run south towards malvern from magnet cove it's an area we would call jones mill right so yes if you're going through jones mill they saw him at a, an actual bridge if I remember correctly, is that correct? It was a railroad bridge, a trestle. Yes. Something. So the guys that were in the train, they actually saw him before the bridge. Mm -hmm. The men that were in the truck that were driving down the highway um, to mm -hmm. meet him at that next crossing, 
that crossing is just after the bridge. Now they saw him as the bridge. Okay. And, and what's interesting is that that crossing, you know, while we were out there searching, um, we actually set up at that crossing on the second day and you can clearly see that bridge from that yes. crossing. You can. It's, and it, it's, it's like he would have only, he, there were only two other directions that he could have gone outside of continuing to go straight. So then we went for a third day and that's the day I was able to come out there and we had the same teams, multiple canines, drones, uh, search and rescue personnel doing grid pattern searches of that entire area, the area we were allowed to get into. And for the most part on the west side of that highway, we were allowed to get pretty much anywhere and everywhere. The, you know, it's mostly owned by utility companies or whatever. And we had access to almost all of it and mm -hmm. we didn't locate any signs other than uh, a shirt, right? Um, and a pair of pants. I, I'm sorry. I, I, yes, a pair of pants. We, we located a pair of pants that could possibly be the pants he was wearing because they thought he was wearing capri pants when they saw him. Come to find out these pants were, were women's pants and they were along the railroad tracks. So from that point, now we're talking about, we go all the way back to January 18th. We're searching in February. So nothing's been seen. We're looking for everything from buzzards. We're looking for everything from, you know, witnesses. And we found multiple people who saw this man. They, they identified Clayton Reed walking down those tracks. Now, what time did they actually see him, Jess? It was between no. 7 and 7.30 a.m. Okay. They actually saw him that morning between 7 and 7.30. Okay. Now, yes. that goes back to the we were told by Robin, who got the information from Clayton's wife, is my understanding, and Clayton's uh, other family members, that he had been missing for the night before. However, we later on were able to clear that up, right? So, Patty... Who did you talk to about the timeline, about different things on the timeline? What have you found out? Yeah, no. mm -hmm. Okay. So I talked to the adoptive father who lives in Malvern and the wife uh, of Clayton's. And what's his name? His name is William Reed. The adoptive father? He's the adoptive father. Okay. Um, he was in Malvern and he lives just north of, of I guess it would be north, would it not be? Would Malvern be north? I think he's south. Malvern, south. Malvern is south of Bangkok. Okay. Yes. All right. So let me back up. I could edit that out. Okay. So I talked to William Reed, the adoptive father, and he lives south of where the RV park was. The um, wife left his house. Well, he, she came to his house around noon, he said, with her two children. Uh, with one which belonged to Clayton and the other one which is older and belongs to a previous uh, husband. And she, about midnight, she woke him up, wanted to go to Clayton's, and she made the comment that she felt that he was trying to reach out to her. She said that she would have him put all of his guns in the driveway so that she would be sure that she was safe. Um, but Mr. Reed talked her out of it. Uh, the roads had gotten icy and bad. She had no fuel in her truck. And he just told her that, you know, she, she didn't need to go. And so she had a job interview the next day. And he said he le she left his house around 8 o'clock, headed towards Hot Springs. And that she would have driven right past the RV park on the way to that job interview. Uh, he doesn't know if she went to that job interview. He doesn't remember the name of the place. Um, but there, he seems a little confused as to what date that it really was. Uh, he thinks that whatever day it was, she showed up in his house. It had, the roads had gotten icy. She got stuck. She ran out of gas. And he thinks it was bad that night because he remembered telling her that the roads were just too bad for her to go. And that, um, you know, her life would, would be in jeopardy if she did. But somehow she ended up making it to 
uh, or, or planned on going to a job interview the next morning, which would have been at eight o'clock. He says she left. Um, so I'm not really sure if Clayton has any weapons with him. I'm not really sure of his, his mental status. I don't know where he was heading. Uh, and I don't think that the family really knows either. I'm just not getting that a clear story of you know okay, so, where he was going. I, so he was erratic. When you're talking about the night before, we're it's safe to assume that would have been January 18th. Correct. She showed up at his house. Now, what is her name? Her name is Heather. Her name is Heather Reed. Okay, so Heather Reed. And Heather shows up at William's house at midnight. And no, he showed it. She showed up about noon. Was... About noon, she showed up okay, at noon, noon, around noon the day the day before. On on the eighteenth. On the eighteenth. Okay. But then around but midnight, she, she, she wants wanted... to leave. At okay. Um. In the meantime, she calls right. her ex husband to pick her son up, her older son. Uh, he has not been back since then. Uh, the baby stayed at Mr. Reed's house, the, the adoptive father. The baby stayed there for several days, I believe, from what he told me. And then she came and got the baby. And I believe that the baby may be with the biological mother of Clayton Reed's at this point. That's what Mr. Reed believes. Okay. So... From that point, we've actually kind of come to a standstill because we, we've found no new evidence linking in any different direction. And here we are now in March. And from this point, y'all have both spoke to different people. And I've also spoke to some people, but you've, uh, you've spoke to, well, you spoke to the biological mother you spoke to the wife and you spoke to the adopted father right mm -hmm. he did adopt him i believe right well he said that and he so, adopted him but he didn't legally adopt yeah. him so i don't know what that means but they have the same last okay. name so so let's talk about what patty tell me a little bit about william reed and what he has told you in regards to his adopted son clayton what he believes may have been going down over the last several years as far as uh, everything from my understanding is, is there was a, some type of PTSD element to there was also some drug use to there was possibly some, some schizophrenia issues. Let's talk about what William Reed's perspective is on that. So he believes that Clayton had been doing some type of drugs. Um, he's, he doesn't seem to be real sure which kind because he first said psychedelic mushrooms. Uh, then he said he believes he might have done meth. Uh, he's not really sure. I think he's just guessing. Um, but he did say that uh, he did read the text. He did see the text. And he believes that he was very dis delusional at the time. Um, he said Clayton came and worked for him for a short period of time. He has another son that's disabled and he was able to hire Clayton to come to his house and Clayton stayed there uh, for a while and he seemed to be doing better. He went back to the RV and then he started struggling with believing in Jesus Christ and believing in the Bible and it just kind of went south from there. He said that he's been very unstable uh, he was told that Clayton pointed at an AR-15 at their uh, at Clayton and Heather's baby, and that's the reason that Heather left was because he pointed the rifle at the baby's head and said, I, I should just take care of your spawn. Now, I don't have any proof that that just, happened. Just, did you, okay, so did Heather confirm any of that for you? What, what was her perspective on that? Um, Heather did not share that information with me, um, but Patty had mentioned text messages and there were text messages that were shared from Clayton to Heather and a lot of it was heavily religious 
Um, he thought that he was God. He thought that him and Heather could recreate the world together. And during those text messages, Heather, you know, responded, responded to Clayton here and there. And in one of those text messages, she had called him out for pointing the gun at their three-year-old. Okay. So she more or less in, in a text message said this happened. He never confirmed it in the text message, right? He, but she did say it in a text message without knowing mm -hmm. that, without being conveyed that we had information about this. You saw a text message that com that said something similar. Okay. Yes. Now, um, when, when this has been now not confirmed, but reaffirmed that this has happened, What's your perspective on the relationship with Heather and Clayton? Do you think that this was um, a situation where they were fighting and she left or he was going crazy and she left? Do you, what, what, what did you get out of the conversations you've had with Heather and, and well, you've also spoken with Robin, the, the bio mother. So where are you at now? What do you think? Well, based off my conversations with Heather and then also the text messages that I've seen, I definitely think that there was either a mental health crisis or, you know, it's possible that there could have been drug use. Um, but I think there was an event that did scare her and that's what led her to leave. Okay. Um, I don't know that I've seen one? all of this. I don't know that I've seen all of the the first do you think this is the first time this has happened or you think this is like a repeating offense i think that clayton you know he had a tiktok and mm -hmm. he obsesses over some he doesn't appear crazy in the tiktoks but they are topics that a lot of us would find a little strange. Um, I think that he has struggled a little longer than what we're being told. Okay. Patty, when it comes to Clayton, we've heard everything from there's a military background that's causing PTSD to he may have a uh, schizophrenia, which may run in his family, which is what we were, I think originally told or mental health problems that are running his family to um, now drug use of psychedelics and psychotropic drugs that are possibly causing some issues. Do you think this is one of the three or all the above or what are you, what are your thoughts when you talk to the, the mother and the stepfather and the wife, what do you, what are you getting from? Well, I get different stories and the stories change. And so I don't really know if they don't know, or I just don't know, but I'd like to find out more about, um, I had heard there was an, an altercation between the two in another town. And I'd like to know what caused that, if that indeed happened. Um, I think it was a volatile relationship, but I don't know if it's, I think it might have been a combination of involved. everything involved. Uh, I think he had a very, I understand that he lived on the streets when he was 16. And I think that he struggled a lot since that time. He was living in an RV on, on the side of the river. Um, he didn't have access to his older children. Uh, there was a custody battle that was going on between him and his ex over the children. And I was told early on that he was homeschooling the children. But I don't see how that would have been possible when he didn't have the children and hadn't had them in a while. Um, I understand that he was the breadwinner, but he didn't have a job. Um then other than the short time that he supposedly worked for the, the adoptive father. 
So I'm really confused all the way around. I don't know how he was supporting himself. I, I don't know if he was if he was doing drugs. Where did he get the resources to do them? Um, I understand that he set fire to the RV the night or morning that he went missing and made it unlivable. I think that was their only place of residence at that time. So I'm not really sure what, what his thinking was there or if he was thinking. I, I just don't know. Uh, that confuses me. I mean, who would burn their, their only residence? Um, he did supposedly go get a cigarette uh, around 5 a.m. from a neighbor in the RV park. And nobody had a ring doorbell or, or any type of security cameras is what I'm told. So I do know that if you believe the neighbor, which I have no reason not to, he was last seen at four o'clock and he was eating a cigarette. I, I don't, I, it just, none of it, it makes sense to me. None of it. Jeremy, none of it. Okay. So yeah. a few things real quick. My understanding is, is, one of the drugs that they believed that he was using and that, well, they more or less said that he was using was mushrooms mm -hmm. and psilocybin or what have you. Now, uh, there's a thing called microdosing. And this is a new method that a lot of doctors are utilizing for PTSD or TBI, uh, traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress syndrome. And uh, do you think that maybe he was actually microdosing to try to help with some type of PTSD, whether it be from uh, some childhood trauma or from um, military-related issues. Or, okay, or I, I'm going to interrupt you right did, there. Did, did we get I'm going to interrupt you right there. On the military, okay. my understanding is that he got an honorable discharge as soon as he had gotten to basic training. I don't know what the military discharge okay. was, but it was a medical discharge. So PTSD okay. from the military, I, I don't know that I could go that far, Jeremy. So was he in, was he in Israel for something? Um, Jessica could probably speak more to that, but I was told that he was in China for quite some time with his mother and stepfather and then they went to Israel and he came back to the United States and that was when he was about 16 years old and that's why he ended up a homeless just, that's my understanding just what do we know about that do we know anything about that Jess so I was yeah my my understanding is kind of the same as Patty's that they were in China for a period and then they went to Israel. Now, the Bible mom has told me that they did live in Israel for a period. And um, it kind of goes back to those roots, specifically with Judaism, um, that Clayton had really started struggling with as far as okay. um, his spirituality and religion. So some of the things... Some of the things he was struggling with that were told, uh, some of the text messages and things he was writing down and things he was talking about was he was upset due to the fact that he wanted to be a Christian, but he had some type of Jewish heritage blood. Um, is that right? Is that what you're saying, Jess? He was, he was struggling. I don't with know that, that it's more. blood. Okay. Yeah, I don't know that it was blood. I think it was more that uh, you know his mom and then the father that he lived with was actually his stepdad um okay. when they lived over there my understanding is that he was pretty strict and raised him pretty strictly jewish okay okay um, so so we don't really know what type of ptsd he could be dealing with and it could be a multitude of things and so yeah when it comes to when it comes to the bio mother you know, she was the original one who contacted us. That was Robin Tollison. And when she originally contacted us, you know, she was very upfront about the fact that she hadn't spoken to Clayton in a while. And she couldn't tell us details of what was going on in his life currently. But she did seem concerned that her son was missing and nobody knew why. Uh, mm -hmm. When it comes to 
to his wife when it comes to Heather, you know, I don't know that Heather um, is not truly concerned. I know that she's been very on and off about how much she's involved or whatever, but that doesn't mean she's not concerned when a person is going through this, when a family victim, when a victim's family member is going through this type of trauma, they're going to have all kinds of reactions. Mm -hmm. But realistically yeah. at this point in time, um, Heather is still subject to questioning, right? She's still, we still have to look at her like, okay, there's some, some things about her stories that don't make sense, but Honestly, Jess, as many cases as I've worked, thousands, that always pops up. So there's that all old adage of, you know, go ahead. It does. And I was going to say also, I know that, that, you know, a lot of what has come from Heather, like it's come out in bits and pieces. And there's a lot, and I still feel like there's a lot that's being withheld. I'm just not sure how much of that is her you know trying to protect Clayton's reputation and then also she does have children in the home and you know her worry for her being in trouble for something as well and, and um, we don't want to the one that at all yeah we don't um but we just want to find the truth. so I, I think that's why things have been coming out in bits and pieces though um you know one thing that that does bother me a little bit is, you know, back in the beginning of this, you know, she had shared that those text messages <clears throat> that she was receiving from him came through the night of the 17th and early into the morning of the 18th. And she had not heard from him since the morning of the 18th. Well, then on the 19th at 7, 7.30 in the morning, like... So the last text message that she would have had from him on the 18th would have been at three o'clock in the morning. And then he's not seen or heard from again after that. Well, he's seen on the 19th, the following day between seven and seven 30 in the morning um, by the railroad crew. You know, there was a lot of hope there because we're thinking, Oh, Clayton had about 26 hours from the time that he left his camper until he's seen, which what is like maybe a mile and a half, two miles from his camper. Right. If yeah, that. it's not that far. I mean it's it's a, and, it's a good walk, but Yeah, but we're thinking, oh, he had to have been somewhere for the last twenty four, twenty six hours. And, you know, really hopeful that he had a plan. Well, and and that's how, you know, the big search that we had scheduled, everybody that we had come out it was based off of that information. That's that's how we set up that search. That's how they set up their grids. That's how, you know, they they came up with the search area. Well, after that three day search is done, um, you know, that's kind of when messages start coming in, text messages, and I'm trying to share them with the team. We'll come to find out Clayton had actually last been heard from on the nineteenth, around okay, three o'clock in the morning. Okay, so Patty, when when you're talking about um, Clayton and William's relationship, it seems to me that uh, William on the phone seemed like he really was concerned, uh, highly motivated to find him um, and everything else. But there has been a lot of things he said that uh, contradicts the other family members. Do you, can you talk more about that? So let's yeah. talk about, um, which one do you want to cover first? Uh, he said several things. He first thought that Clayton had just walked away and probably died of hypothermia. And now he believes that it's possible someone picked him up on the road. Um, he said that at first he said Clayton had mental problems and, now he's kind of alluding to a drug issue. He's also alluded to some domestic abuse in the past. Um, he has, I mean, 
he's always believed that Clayton is gone. I mean, I don't think I've ever picked up when that you, he, you say gone, he had you, any you belief mean, that he was still alive. Dead? Deceased. So he, he's alluded to, there. yeah, he's dead. He's, there's no chance we're going to find him alive. Jess, what is what is Heather or Robin or any of the other family members said alluding to that? What What's their thoughts? So, right now? all right. So first, Robin, his mother, um, she, I think that there's the, that human side of her that she is going to have hope until there is physical evidence not to have hope. But, you know, she has shared with me um, that as a mother, she just has this feeling that he's no longer with us. Um, okay. Now, Heather, on the other hand, Heather is very hopeful. And Heather um, thinks that if anybody could survive out in the wilderness, like off the grid, that it would be Clayton. Now, in her defense, I will say his, like I said, his TikTok videos, it they are all about self-preservation and survival. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, he seemed like he would have been fairly prepared, but the problem is, is that everything he had, as far as to be prepared, like all these, these kits and the guns and the, um, survival packs and all of those things, they were all either in the camper or they were all in his truck and Heather and the children had the truck in Malvern um, and still have the truck. So Clayton does not have any of his survival gear. He has none of those things that, you know, that he had planned for. Okay. Well, let, let's look at this from the standpoint of what, what the rules tell us. Okay. Rules are going to tell us this. We know he left his camper. We're 95 to 99% sure he left walking because we have witnesses that have no ties to, to give us any lies or anything like that. And there's multiple witnesses that saw him that morning walking a few miles away south towards Malvern. We know that... According to them, he had no shoes on. He was wearing a t-shirt and jeans of some kind. No jacket. Didn't appear he had a cell phone. Uh, his wallet was supposedly at, still at the camper. He had none of his belongings. I mean, realistically, it was very cold. So there's only one of a few scenarios that happened in this, in this situation. He has walked off, walked into the woods somewhere, and froze and and passed. He has walked off, ran into somebody who gave him a ride somewhere, and we found no evidence of that, no hospitals, no, no one else who's come forward and said we found him. His posters have been all over the news and everything else. Nobody said we've seen this guy. So that doesn't mean it doesn't, it hasn't happened. It just means that we don't have anything to point that one, that direction. So then your other scenario is, is someone who had it out for him for some reason. They had some type of um, issues to resolve with him, ran into him and made him go away, made him disappear. Whether it's something he did the day he went missing or whether it's something he had done previously. We don't really know. Though those could be a multitude of things. I mean, there was a story about a, a mattress burnt in the middle of the road, not too long after he went missing some time in that time frame, in the Magnet Cove area. We know he was burning things because he tried to set his camper on fire. So there's, there's some tendency to think that that could have been him. Uh, no one was ever able to prove to us one way or another at that point whether it was or wasn't. Do we have any reason to believe that somebody in his past or somebody in his present um, may have had problems with him to the point that they would just make him go missing? Uh, do we have any reason to believe that? 
So the, you know, those are the scenarios that we look at and go, could happen. I mean, you even could ask, oh, did he get on the train? You know, how do we know he didn't get on the train? Well, just um, mistake me if I'm, or correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it was a two car train and they saw him the entire time. And the other workers saw him walking later on past that train. Is that right? So, I mean, it's real simple. He either walked off into the woods and didn't make it out of the woods on his own by he did it to himself or it, it was an accident due to the drugs or psychotic nature he was in or somewhere along the way he ran into somebody he got into beef with he pissed them off he may have burnt something or what have you uh and they said all right we'll take care of you and they took care of him and they, they were reporting that or he ran into somebody that he had a pass with somebody that he had history with that something's going on in their recent or former past, whether it be a drug dealer or a family member or, you know, uh, somebody that was involved in his life and happened to know where he was. Now that gets into a real tricky situation because he didn't have his phone with him from what we understand. So there are a lot of scenarios. What do you think is the most likely Patty? Um, Well, there's a couple things that I don't think that we've mentioned yet, and that was the fact that the waterways there next to the RV park were very, very high at the time that he went missing, right after he went missing. And now let's keep in fact that he had no shoes on and you did find a pair of pants. And we know that if somebody suffers from hypothermia, they will start feeling like they're getting really hot. They'll start shedding clothing. So that's a possibility. Um, the possibility that he was picked up by someone on the road, I think, is very great because as the railroad people saw him, they, they were driving down the road and they could see him on the tracks. And you had mentioned that that was a heavily traveled highway. So I think that there's a possibility if I can't put myself in his position, but I, I think that he could have frozen to death. I think he could have gotten in the water and possibly have been washed out. I do know that the canine handlers told me that the Corps of Engineers said that that waterway was so high that they had opened the floodgates, and I forgot the amount of water per cubic second that was going through those five gates that they opened, but they actually worried about the integrity of the dam. So you've got that. Um, so at this point, I, I, it's just a, kind of a toss-up to me. Uh, I, I'm still concerned about the weapons, why he did not take a weapon with him, regardless of what frame of mind he was. There's another thing that puzzles me is that she made the assessment that he had no shoes. And that seems to be confirmed by the railroad people. But he had set the camper on fire and I understand the camper had been ransacked uh, to the point that everything was just completely torn up and thrown down on the floor and so i'm not sure how she knew that he had no shoes on but that obviously was confirmed by the railroad people of people because they said he did not have shoes on is that correct you're saying is this she told the police that she believed he didn't have shoes because she checked the camper and there was no shoes or all his shoes were there but you're saying that there's no way that she would have been able to know that because he had set fire to some stuff in the camper and there's a good possibility he could have burnt the shoes. And why wouldn't she assume that versus he had no shoes? Right. My understanding right. Is, okay. And my understanding is that the camper was so heavily damaged that someone that I interviewed said that he stuck his head in the RV and it was just total, to, just totally just trash. And that he really could not tell how anybody would know whether there were shoes missing or not. Now, when he got there, he said the wife was sitting on the banks of the water. And that concerns me for her safety because at this point, did she know all his weapons were secured? You know, I would have been worried if I was worried about my safety. I would have been afraid to have sat out there in a lawn chair for a long period of time, not knowing where he's at. Jessica, did you go to the camper? Um, I'm on the outside of it. Um, and 
you know, the plan was I was going to go to the camper and was actually going to visit her there. Well, that was also about this time that we were able to identify the railroad workers. And, you know, we were able to show them a picture of Clayton, all three of them and one of them in the truck, 100%. This was Clayton. And so with that being said, our search kind of shifted. It shifted from the area around the camper to down at Jones Mill, you know, down the tracks. Um, now, I let's will say as far as that, the Jess, guns. You, you, you went out for just a little bit, Jess, so go back to the go back to the part where you're saying um, you went to the camper and the reason why the camper got kind of thrown out of the mix was because of you just kind of redo that because you're you cut out for just a second okay so the original plan was that i was going to meet her at the camper and i was going to visit her there that was about the time though that we were able to identify the uh railroad railroad workers and was able to show them a picture of clayton and um all of them a hundred percent without a doubt that was that was Clayton Reed and they were a little delayed on reporting seeing him because you know like they said it's not it's it's completely normal for them to run into homeless people along the tracks for example so they kind of thought this was just a homeless person that needed some help and that's why they went and got the, the you know a pair of boots got him a change of clothes got him a coat and it was the next day when it started spread, spreading around on social media that Clayton was missing and one of the workers' wives had seen it and showed it to him and he was like, oh my goodness, we saw that guy yesterday. We saw him yesterday morning. And, um, you know, in fact, they even over the weekend, they had contacted law enforcement to let law enforcement know that they had seen him on track. Um, but as far as the guns... According oh, to Heather, we're, we're, information... Where we're at now... Go ahead, with the guns. Um, but I was going to say, according to Heather, you know, Patty had mentioned, um, you know, her feeling safe or whatnot, but according to Heather, Clayton had three guns, and Heather says that all three of those guns were still inside the camper, that they were actually on the bed, on the mattress. Okay. So, where we're at now, Dan is after listening to all the sides of the story um there's because he was obviously trying to hitchhike because he jumped on the train and said i want to ride he was probably tired of walking he told him to turn around he told him to turn around right yeah mm -hmm. turn, turn, turn the train around and go back the way i want you to go and so we think there's a possibility that he got in a car with somebody because he was trying to hitchhike he was trying to get a ride to where he was trying to go we believe that was malvern we believe he was trying to get down to his adopted father's house to see his wife. And, and that's where we think he was going. We don't know that. Uh, at the same time, his, his wife was going to a job interview and she would have been passing by that same direction. She'd have been going to hot Springs, which would have been going right by him to go to hot Springs. So we believe that there's a possibility he got in a vehicle. So if, if this podcast is going to do anything, one of the things we want to do is to reach out to the public and say, if you picked up a guy when it was cold outside and you didn't think anything of it, you just like, well, this homeless guy, I'm giving him a ride. It might not have just been a homeless guy. It might have been somebody who's a missing person who the family is in, in search of right now. There is always going to be speculation in any missing person case like this where somebody just goes disappearing out of thin blue there's always going to be speculation that there's a multitude of things that could have happened and we can't rule out any of those at this point we don't have the ability to rule out any of them uh the, we do know we're fairly certain he was seen we have multiple eyewitnesses that identified him that they're credible witnesses they're unbiased witnesses there's no reason to believe that what they said they saw they didn't see uh we know he was texting right before he went missing so we kind of have a timeline of when he went missing. What we don't know is where he went from those railroad tracks forward. We don't know if he, we do know allegedly there was a, a mattress burnt just a little ways down the railroad tracks. There was a mattress burnt not too far from the tracks. 
Um, we've not been able to dig into that too far yet, but we're, we're still, that's one of those questions that we got to answer. It, um, it, and we still have, we still have questions of the family. You know, the family is, um, some of them have been on and off with us and some of them seem very concerned and others, sometimes you, you have to have concerns about their story changing. But the reality is, is that's that way with any eyewitness, anytime you're dealing with an eyewitness or somebody who's trying to remember what happened, especially if, remember a couple months ago. So we're not trying to put out a story out here to, to point blame or point fingers or, or get the, you know, this family member must have done something. We're not trying to do that at all. What we're just trying to put out is the facts. They all have different stories because that's just the way it's like the game telephone. If you put 30 people in a room and I, I whisper in your ear or something, and then you whisper it to the next person, by the time it gets all the way back around, it's going to be a completely different story. And that's what we're dealing with here is this game of telephone. That's the way this thing goes, especially when it gets on social media and everybody has their own theories. We're, we're not dealing with, with, you know, speculation. We want some facts. We've got enough speculation. We need some more facts. So if anybody out in the public has some more facts to what might have happened to Clayton, we need that. The law enforcement needs that. The family needs that so that we can locate him. And, you know, if, if, it's, if it's a sad situation when we do, that's horrible. And I, and I hope that we can locate him alive. I do. Um, the facts don't necessarily point in that direction, but I'm not giving up hope yet. Uh, I will tell you, I had a missing person that was a similar case where a guy went missing out in the woods. He just walked off in the woods, drove two states away, and just walked off out in the woods, out in the beautiful countryside. And everybody thought, well, he just went out there and killed himself. And for six months, we looked for him. And then later on, we found out, well, he had done that and then got out on the road and hitchhiked to a few more states away and put up a note saying, hey, called and talked to his family, said, y'all quit looking for me. You know, don't look for me anymore. I don't want to be found. And Clayton, as an adult, has that right. Mm -hmm. But what we hope is, is we just hope that we know if that's the case, that's the case so we can put the, give the family some ease. Yeah. So anybody that knows anything, anything, minute or not, if you've seen somebody that looks like him, give us a holler. Give law enforcement a holler so we can, you know, try to get some closure for this family. We don't, we're not here to point fingers. We're just here to say facts. And there's a lot of speculation out there. But we don't need any more of that. We, we've got plenty of that. You know, theories are great and all, but what we need are some facts right now. Um, Patty, do you have anything to add to that? No, I don't have anything to add to that other than now I do know that Hot Spring County, uh, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, Jesse, they did the heat seeking drone search for him. Do you remember? Was that at night? I believe. I'm not entirely sure because I know that it was nighttime when. When the railroad guys, I think it may have been because it was the evening when the railroad guys called and um, uh, reported what they had seen because they did not know that there was a missing person, like I said, until the uh, uh, flyers had started making its rounds um, on social media. And according to the railroad guys, a deputy came out like almost right away. So I, I believe it was. I could be wrong, but I believe it was. I believe okay. it was nighttime. And they got no results. Nothing. Um, and it was it was a drone that had a heat signature and they said they saw a lot of deer, but they did not they didn't see Clayton. Didn't see any, you know, human figure. But then again, I mean, if he wasn't there, they wouldn't have and you know, at that point, it would have been the night of the 21st. And, you know, if he was out there and deceased, you know, it's not going to pick up a heat signature. So the heat seeking drone has been out there. The cadaver dogs have been out there. The search dogs uh, mm -hmm. have done ground search. Um, pretty much everything. Uh, are you how how sure are you that 
that that area has been covered. covered. I what percentage am, of that area do you think is in covered? The the days that we were out there, they covered. Oh, Jeremy, how many square miles was it? I mean, it was an astonishing amount. Um, it's a it's a large area, but the problem is, is it's only the west side of the highway because that's where all the evidence mm -hmm. we had, the genes and and the witnesses all pointed to. The tracks actually go back and forth in different directions for different reasons, but um, if you get into the east side of that highway, there's a whole world of woods out there that can go on for for a long ways. Mm -hmm. Um, you're not, you're not going to search that without a very large team, unless you have like some type of path to go by. Um, you know, I, I think that we could utilize the, where the mattress was found and maybe try to do some grid out there, but you're, you're talking about a lot of things. And, and this is the thing that bothers me is if somebody picked him up somewhere around there, in that magnet cove area now on the highway yeah that that's a highway that's a major thoroughfare from hot springs to the interstate 30 you have a lot of people that don't belong in the area out there all the time that's not an uncommon thing but if you go back into those woods on the east side and you get into the magnet cove area it, if somebody saw him in that area and he didn't belong that's a small community yeah. they're going to know it I mean, I live. So in I have a question, and, and I will tell I have you a right question. now that anybody, and everybody, there would know. Okay. Okay. So here's my question: If we think that the jeans belonged to him, or he was wearing the jeans, that would mean that he had no clothes on down to his underwear when he got to the road. I would not pick up someone in their underwear. I wouldn't either, but this is also I would Spring County. <laughs> would you report it? You know, um, yeah, but but would you report it? There's some yeah. I would. Yeah, I, I think that there's there's a lot of questions to that. I mean, you're talking about it was very cold. Uh, I, there's a lot of questions to go with that, and I think we can you know maybe dig into that further next time. But you know, here's what I want to say. If you are out there and you have seen Clayton or you think you might have and you don't want to contact law enforcement for whatever reason, and I understand there's a lot of people that don't, you can get a hold of us at RememberEveryVictim.com. You, you can call us at 1-833-373-8267. 833-373-8267. Report your sighting and we can follow it up for you. We just are trying to get some closure to a family that is missing their loved one. That's it. That's what we're trying to do. We're not trying to persecute or prosecute anybody at this point. We're just trying to find Clayton. Okay. And we need your help. There's even little things can help that you don't understand. Uh, Jess, do you have anything to add to that? Don't think that I have. I don't think I have anything else to add it at this time. So remember, go to our website, rememberevervictim.com. Follow us on Facebook, Revamp. Um, if you have anywhere you listen to your podcast or Crimecast, you can find us. That's We're going to be on all the social medias and everything else, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, iHeart. And um, we, we have a lot of cases that we're working, and we hope that, you know, we get our information out there for these families we need your help to locate and solve these cases that's how we're going to do it we don't there's no part of any of this that's that's one person that does it it's it's a it's a group so thank you for listening and we hope to see you next time at natural state of murder crime cast thank you thank you Revamp is committed to forging a robust network of clear communication and understanding among the victim, the victim's family, law enforcement, and all parties involved in an unresolved case. Our mission is to provide a thorough service that uncovers resources, delivers vital information to support all parties, and rekindles public interest in these cases.